Board of Liquor Control. Um, first up is public comment. This is anything for the Liquor Control Board, not the Select Board. Let's see, and then you will do approval of the agenda. I motion to approve the agenda. Second. Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next up is approving the liquor licenses. <coughs> Any concerns with any of them? Any reason not to move everything? Is that a motion? I motion to approve the microphone, um, to approve the renewals of liquor license. All second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Now we'll call the select board meeting to order. First up is public comment. This is public comment for the select board of anything not on the agenda. Uh, I'd like to make a comment, please. Just identify yourself for the record. Uh, sure. My name is Mark Wallenga. I live at 81 Hilltop Drive in Randolph Center, uh, north of 66, kind of off Rogers Road there. Um, you know the holdovers from last year are probably familiar with who I am and what my issue has been over the course of the past year um, for Stephanie and Eric. A little, it's a little history. Um, so you only get a couple minutes under public comment. Right. Yep. Yeah. Um, there's there, in 2020 they shuttered the fairgrounds due to COVID restrictions, and uh, the folks next door decided to start hosting tractor pulls um, at their residence, and you know it's fairly close proximity to the neighboring um, community. It's a residential area and a rural agricultural area. Uh, the byproducts of those events have made it kind of miserable for the folks out there. Um, the pollution, you know, whether it's noise pollution or the emissions, um, you know, kind of intrinsic tractor poles, you know, some of these high performance tractors can cause, cause the ground to shake, tremors, so your house shakes, you have uh, your windows rattle on you, um, goes on all day long, it's once a month. So we came here last year, a group of the neighbors um, seeking some sort of relief from the select board because there's some interplay there in between the public assemblies ordinance and the land use regulations, but the language is, um, in my opinion, needs to be cleaned up a little bit to maybe separate out like motorsport competition from, you know, and make a differentiation between that and like a church luncheon, for example. Because in my mind, it's not an apples to apples uh, scenario. So uh, I just wanted to touch base with you guys because I hate to pass you with emails. I know I've, I've sent you a few here and there um, over the course of the past 10 months and try and find out whether or not that's still on the agenda, if that's been talked about internally, if anybody's interested in pursuing um, something to, uh, you know, provide some sort of relief for the folks living out there. So the topic was handed to the Planning Commission. Okay. Because they go through the process of evaluating that in compliance with all the other sure. pieces that are out there. Okay. Um, and so we can we can check with them or you can check with them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we'll do and that. get you a status. Yeah, I just figured right. I'd talk to you guys because of the interplay between the ordinance and, and how it's tied to the land use regulations, you know. So they'll help us draft the ordinance too yep. and do the public meetings on it and the, yep, all the outreach and appreciate it. On that. Any other public comment? Hi, my name is Hannah Arias. I'm a resident of Randolph. Um, I am here tonight with concerns about REC and most specifically the summer camp. Um, some people may think I have a bias in this category, uh, and while I, that may be, um, I like to think that I have a keen insight uh, into what is possible um, and, a, and a bar that, that needs to be maintained. There's very little communication to parents about summer camp. Um, and most importantly, I'd say about the use of the pool. Um, there has been talk that the kids will be going to the river, um, which brings up significant safety concerns, which have not been responded to um, by the rec department. And you know, on a, on a personal level, I'm lucky. I have other options um, for where my kids can go in the summer. 
Um, my concern is for those families who don't have a lot of options um, and really rely on the summer camp for <clears throat> childcare, for social and, and active things for their kids to do during the summer. Um, the rates were also raised without any notice. So if less is being offered, like the pool, um, and, and we're paying more for it, uh, an explanation would also be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. And no disrespect to your meeting, but I'm off to clean this softball field. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I couldn't figure out how to change that, but we're both here anyway. Um, so I just wanted to uh, bring to the board's attention the um, ongoing issue of tractor trailers using Maple Street. Um, both ends of Maple Street have signs that say no tractor trailers. And um, that is a, it's an ongoing, there's tractor trailers that come down Maple Street every day. Um, today, one went down uh, in one direction. And when I saw it coming back, I went out, I got the driver to stop. And I said, why are you using this street? You know, did you see the sign? And um, I asked him, is your GPS sending you here? Which he confirmed, which I don't really understand. Um, and I know that's a very difficult thing to solve. But he did say that he didn't see the sign until it was too late. Now, of course, he already saw it in one direction, presumably, when he came down the street up from the other direction, from Main Street. But in any case, um, I don't know what the solution is. I do have one possible, like, uh, physical solution that could be done for relatively inexpensively. And I will uh, send the select board that idea for your consideration. But somehow we have to physically keep trucks from using Maple Street because obviously signs, I know in the past enforcement hasn't really worked and it's an ongoing problem. So I appreciate your consideration of that. Yep, thank you. Is that it? Yep. Um, on the corner of 65 Central Street, uh, there has been an ongoing problem, at least since the four years that I've lived there, that the 25 mile an hour speed limit is not adhered to by the vast majority of the travelers, nor is it enforced. Um, it would be wonderful for <coughs> pedestrians um, if the speed limit was enforced. I recognize that without a police force right now, um, that would be rather difficult, but even once the force is established, um, I, I don't see things changing much. I want to know if there's been any consideration to the automatic speed traps, which wouldn't slow people down, but at least it would ticket them and provide revenue for the town, as well as maybe <coughs> providing an incentive to not continue to speed through there if they're a regular traveler. Um, the other thing that I would like to know if there's been any consideration, again, um, for pedestrian safety is all of the crosswalks along Main Street, there are a ton of them, but they're not that easily seen. Um, and I think one simple solution would be to do double-sided signs, because as a driver, you are scanning both sides of the street. If they were on both sides, that would be helpful. And if you've ever traveled through um, Northfield, the Norwich, uh, crosswalk signs, they have a button and then there is an a <laughs> LED flashing light, which makes it very visible. And I don't think that that would be something um, that would be too outrageous to do, but I think it might have a huge impact. Thank you. Um, Chairman, just place to look might be in when we got the grant to do all that work downtown. I think part of it was um, crosswalk painting and whatnot, <clears throat> specifically not to have signs in the downtown. But I'm not sure on that, but we look at it. Could I have one more second? Yeah. 
speed humps. Um, that is also something I would be interested in seeing. I know the speed humps have not been replaced on School Street. Not really sure why, now that the plowing is done with. Um, but that would be a way to ensure that people slow down. Um, and I know that there has been some discussion, not in a formal setting, about um, them being used on a main thoroughfare, but in Jericho, they're there and they work. They slow people down. Uh, so that's another thing that I would really love to see, um, whether it be the town or <clears throat> us landowners providing some sort of speed hump. Um, landowners can't provide speed I'm humps being in public facetious. there, but, <laughs> and it also doesn't always slow them down. Sometimes it gives them a launch, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> Depends what you drive. <laughs> right. Is there any? Um, I have a comment about that, if, if I can. Uh, we're not discussing it. Okay. Yep. All right. We're done with the public comment. Approval of the agenda. Um, one of the things we need to add on executive session, right? Was uh, lawyer. Yeah, we've got some attorney client communication to add, so with that one, it would be under 1 BSA 313A1F, which is specifically for that purpose. And it'd still be the two motions that are recommended in there, with the finding first and then the motion to enter. Any other adjustments? I'll, I'll, I'll move that we approve the agenda with the addition to the executive session of an attorney client um, issue under one VSA. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those? Aye. Uh, consider the first Friday public assembly permit. Mm -hmm. Peter, you're here on behalf of the applicants. Yes. Um, so I'm Peter Reed. I'm the chair of uh, the board of RACDC, and I've been involved in the downtown committee for a number of years. And uh, last year, with uh, the spearheading, let's say, by uh, Stephanie, um, we we managed to get first Friday done. It was a, I think. A good success. I think people had fun, so we're proposing to do it again. Uh, in that process, uh, I think due to the time of, uh, constraints, I submitted the application. There have been a few changes since that time, um, based on some concerns that were raised, and there's there's some other concerns that have been raised in the last few days that uh, we're continuing to look at. So I, I guess I'm I'm not in a position to ask for approval. Um, tonight, but I, I guess I would like a, a general sense that, that we can continue on, assuming we can get some of the things corrected. So uh, specifically, the uh, some of the issues that were raised were of the closing the street at 4.30, um, which did impact some businesses. So we're proposing to push the event out another half an hour. So we would start it at 5.30 and close the street at 5. So I'm hoping that wouldn't affect any businesses that weren't planning on being involved in First Friday themselves. Um, the noise level was commented on by a number of people, and I think we're going to try to tailor the, the bands uh, to be something a little toned down from, um, it was great having heavy metal and blues last year, but I think uh, it was a little loud, and, and it was hard for people to converse in the street and created some other problems. So. That's, that's one thing we're looking at changing. Um, additionally, some things that were raised were uh, security, which we really didn't have any formal security last year. We didn't have porta potties. Uh, so we're investigating both those items. Um, I don't have an answer on that yet, but uh, um, we are trying to make sure we smooth over any, any issues around that. Um, 
And we're, we're also, I think we have some additional resource now at RECDC that will help us manage this. And uh, we realized that the time we uh, proposed of starting it in May was a little aggressive. So we're, we're now proposing to start the event with the first Friday in June and, and skip Cinco de Mayo. Um, I'm sure there'll be other parties going on. <laughs> so that's the, the basic layout. Um, I'm glad to answer any questions, but I, I guess my hope would be that we could get a, an approval in principle to move forward and with the understanding by the next meeting or sometime in the interim, we could come back with some specifics on a couple of those points that have been raised. Peter, were the concerns about the volume levels uh, from residents or businesses or participants? I, I think it was a little of both. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know some people in the red line really were into it and some people probably weren't. So, you know, it's, I, I didn't really hear any, a, a whole lot of concerns raised last year when we did it, but uh, admittedly we did not really get this going again to try to start gathering information until a couple weeks ago. So we've had a couple meetings of, of uh, some of the downtown businesses trying to kind of get things formulated and we'll continue to do that. You addressed the parking challenges. There were some people who reside there that were, there were some complaints about the business folks parking in their spot so they couldn't get in. The, you get that part sorted out? Yeah. Well, I, I think the, the parking issue we had last year was more around Fisher and customers not being able to come in at the end of the day. So we tried to designate some, spark, some spots around the corner um, in, the, uh, in the back street area that uh, Luke gave us the okay on. Um, that didn't work 100%, but we, we tried to accommodate. But um, for the residents that live there, it's, it, it is, you know, it's an issue. I mean, they, they can't have their cars there in the middle of the, the event. So um, we did knock on a couple doors and ask people to move their cars. Um, I didn't hear a lot of concern about that, but if, if it's a big issue, uh, I'm not sure how we really resolve that. I, I, I know that parking has been an issue in town with a lot of people. I personally don't think it's that big an issue, but if I can't park in front of my apartment, then it is an issue. So. There's a town parking lot right there. Right. I mean, there, we, we have plenty of space. We have so space. I'm um, wondering if it is a matter of redirecting. Instead of directing people to park out on the back street, if those businesses that are going to remain open and whatnot, maybe there are people parking Encourage people town, to go to the front of the lot. lot. Yeah. and not take the resident spots on the back street. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we can try to give people a little more direction on that. Yeah. And it might be helpful to even you know, just flyer the businesses and the residents before each first Friday and just kind of remind them or in some way communicate with them. A lot of, like the older residents in the Red Lion may not be um, as you know, email savvy as the rest of us. So right. I was thinking of different ways well, that they can be notified. Last year we posted 24 hours ahead of time on all the street signs, mm -hmm. neon signs, yeah. no parking tomorrow, five to seven, whatever it was. It, it worked so it was pretty posted, well. Yeah, and um, the few people I had to knock on is usually the same woman above in one area, I'll say. Um, and she was like, oh shoot, I forgot. And she just would run down and apologize. Yeah. And yeah. I didn't see any problems with the red, like, the residents there okay. on Merchants Row, but I did hear from some people that ended up um, coming back um, after work hours, and a lot of the parking downtown, um, other apartment people um, felt like there wasn't much space. So maybe, like Stephanie suggested, more signage for a specific suggested first Friday parking, and then maybe be able to still have whatever the parking by the Gear House, which I know a lot of apartment folks above the main block live in, uh, park in. And since we were back behind the gear house, we saw a lot of those people's reactions. Um, so maybe figuring out the best course area to say is First Friday parking. Um, behind Jean's building, or uh, the Brainstorm Arts. Oh, she yeah. offered her parking lot last year. We didn't sign it. So we put signs up there. You probably get some, like, the, maybe like gear house can house, like have the bike riders park over there or something. Because right. she's got a lot back there. Or maybe like um, like Gearhouse definitely brings in a lot of the bikes. Maybe we could like shuttle them somehow from the high school or something. Yeah, I mean the, the lot here is you know I wouldn't 
expect it to be full either. So yeah, I walked around town. I don't remember at the Du Bois and King lot too, right there on School Street. None of it was really overflowing full. So nobody wants to walk. No, it's a free event. You know, so <laughs> yeah. if you can't walk two blocks to it, then I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. about the um, town provided traffic barrier last year. That was actually someone's POV. That wasn't a town provided barrier, a personal car to block off the street. We, we did that in some cases. Uh, we got the barrier from here. I think it's hiding in the office there the last couple of times. So okay. uh, yeah, that was not always our best moment, but uh, it's, it's hard because you have to leave it open to get everyone in there and then, uh, so. Okay. But we will try to make sure we have that barrier out there. Okay. Anybody have any concerns with them having the event? They'll have I, to revise the application, but. I, I'll raise one other issue that, that actually um, Erica brought up with me is the alcohol. And the way it worked was you could only technically consume alcohol within the, the areas designated for each of the restaurants. And there are basically three of them. Um, that I, I didn't see a problem with that. I didn't see people drinking out in the other areas, but I guess there were people going into your areas right. to drink with booze they had brought in from outside. So yep. that I think, with maybe a little better policing, we could we could help with and not have it be up to the business owners to be doing that. I think a call for volunteers may help that too. Just having some people stand outside of those areas to make sure to help the staff, so that way it's not on the businesses. I mean, last year we looked at doing the whole event as being alcohol available, but that just creates a whole new layer of problems. So I'd rather avoid that if we could. Yeah. Yeah, when I called the person, she's like, there's really not a way to do that. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to basically have like one business be in charge of the whole entire street with the catering license. And so it's, then you have to hire security because you can't really put all that onto one business. And then that takes away alcohol sales from the other two businesses. For outside consumption, at least, they would still be able to sell inside their businesses. So that makes it kind of almost less desirable for the businesses overall. Is there the possibility of, especially given the uncertainties <coughs> around policing and sheriff services right now, is there a possibility of hiring something like Green Mountain Concert Services or Chocolate Thunder, which is the other? Event security, big firm in the state to just have one or two, um, you know, hired security staff to kind of keep an eye on things. Yeah, I think that's what we're going to have to look at. Yeah. Um, and it's, I mean, the the issue is then it layers on some costs that we didn't incur last year. We were able to do this pretty affordably, but if if that's what it takes, we'll uh, we'll find a way. I, I would imagine it would be a concern of concern of the liquor control authorities as well, and in putting the onus on on, on the vendors or, or the, the restaurant tours is clearly not an, you know, fair. So. Well, RACDC is providing the event insurance, so we have a vested interest as yeah. well uh -huh. in making sure. Yeah. I think you're hearing that it's supported. Um, you just have to change the application to show the different okay. things that you want to have different and send it back. Okay, how, how soon, if we get that back uh, in a couple <laughs> weeks and then review it again at the next select board meeting, is that fair? That's fair. Okay. That'll be before your June date. Yeah. yeah okay. Sense. All right, thank you. All right. Conservation Commission's Timber Harvest Plan. Can you guys speak on that? Okay. I'm Brendan Barden from Town of Randolph and Conservation Commission member. And uh, we have uh, separated into two questions in case there were any more concerns with one versus the other, but it's all around an updated forest management plan on the John Sayward Memorial Forest on Tatro Hill Road. Uh, so it was due for its... Uh, update of the forest management plan and the county forester has 
drafted an update and the Conservation Commission has recommended our approval of that plan update and uh, just needs your sign off. So there's one memo to that effect, uh, just about approving the amended plan in general. And let's take that one. Yep. And then we'll come to the next one. Yep. Anybody have any questions on the management plan that was submitted? It's very uh, I do. Are you a board member, Josie? Sorry. Out of time. Long time. Um, as far as the timber thinning is concerned, um, do we have an idea of where the sales funds will be going to? Um, Historically, they go flow into the conservation fund, which is a town fund, but earmarked for uh, conservation projects. The, um, the Conservation Commission typically makes recommendations of how to spend those funds, and the select board approves that. And so the stumpage payments um, have gone into that in the past. It's up to the select board. Where the funds go. Yeah. That's where all that works. Um, in the past, they have flowed both directions the general fund and the conservation oh, okay. fund. A lot of it, I think, depends on the size of the job. Okay. A small job, they're only going to get a few thousand bucks for it, different than one you're going to get 30,000 for. So, thank you. Any questions on the forest plan? If not, I'm you have a question on the forest management plan, Josie? Uh, I'm afraid I, I don't have a specific question. I have a comment, and um, uh, I'm, I'm only here because I read the, on the agenda uh, as on Front Porch Forum and wanted to um, um, put in the comment that uh, last week, um, the Department, Federal Department of the Interior uh, uh, enacted a conservation rule. I, I don't know the technicalities of it, um, which stresses the importance of old growth and mature forests for preserving ecosystems, uh, biodiversity, and uh, keeping carbon in the ground, storing a lot of carbon annually. And because, and I, so I wanted to um, stress that uh, the, whatever timber harvesting uh, is taking place that I would earnestly hope that it would comply with some of the new guidelines coming out of the federal government um, that uh, we, our town has public lands the way the uh, federal government has public lands. And um, there is a strong argument to be made for our public lands, uh, preserving and protecting our future, um, as well as current revenue needs, that the future needs to be represented uh, in these considerations. So thank you for listening. Okay. Um, anybody want to make a motion to accept the county foresters update? I'll make that motion that we accept the county foresters update. Second. Are those in favor? Aye. Aye. <clears throat> so your plan's adopted. Yeah, the second question. Yes. Um, so the, the timber harvest is part of the second question, just that we do proceed with that, which which was also recommended in the schedule of the plan. Um, but the I guess the key question about that was the county forester would like to uh, sell the job as a uh, negotiated sale with a contractor um, or evaluate a small group of contractors and make the decision based on his evaluation of who's most uh, able to do the job with um, protecting the land uh, and the, the residual uh, stand that's going to be left behind to grow into the next generation of trees. Um, so he wants to do a, a negotiated sale with that uh, contractor versus just putting it out to bid to the to the highest bidder. So it's really a question about the, the purchasing policy, I guess, and whether that's allowed for the contracting piece for 
the, the county for, and we, we have done that before anyway, there is precedent in the 2015 sale that occurred on the property. I don't know prior to that what the uh, history was, um, but I know that at least once the, the county forester did do it this way where they uh, evaluated a small group of contractors, we put it in their uh, control, and then uh, of course the select board was involved with uh, uh, approving that uh, that contract with the, the logging contractor ultimately, but it was done on a, a negotiated sale basis versus a straight bid to the, to the highest bidder uh, regardless of any other consideration. So the county forester uh, asked if he could do that again. The Conservation Commission has recommended that we allow him to do that, and so the question is before the select board in that regard, if he can proceed with a negotiated sale. Have they given you anything that shows the difference, like what the what the, the benefit is of, of going that route versus just hiring a logger? Well, they talked about the uh, the impact on the uh, on the, the soils and the residual stand being the the uh, what could go well or poorly depending on the logging contractor that sold is is the one side of it and then um, it's it's possible but not certain that you could get more money in stumpage from a contractor who doesn't pay attention to the quality of you know the the damage they're doing to the soils or the damage to the residual trees on the on the property so, so there's not a, a, I don't have numbers or to put towards it but those are qualitatively the considerations and is the town responsible for paying the individual that oversees all the actions then of the company selected to make sure they don't choose the wrong trees or do the wrong the wrong like who no who the, the county works? the county forester serves as the um, the, the one managing the, the sale um, and but you know they uh, f free of you know additional charges you know one of the benefits of the town to have the county forester do that work uh, no additional charge there he's not there all the time he's not there you know most of the time um, so they put a certain amount of trust a lot of trust you know in the logging contractors and of course there's a contract with stipulations, but uh, I guess the, the issue, um, and, and having worked as a logger in the past myself, I know about this as well, one of the issues is, you, you know, you once the damage is done, you, you know, you can't really go backwards. So you can't really, you can't necessarily police it, which is why they like to choose somebody that they're comfortable with, as opposed to when you when you just put it out straight to bid, you, you might end up with somebody who offers to pay the most, and you're, if you're obligated to just accept that, uh, you know, you might just end up, the fear, I guess, is that you might end up with a, a job that you're not happy with and not really have that much recourse. So the forester wants to be the one to put it out to bid or the town has to put it out to bid? The forester would take care of that. And then, so what do they do, have a qualification selection to get down to their few? I mean, I don't believe they can just, I'm just thinking of our procurement policy and how it all works. we got to have some way of having a fair and open selection process. So I think we can do qualification-based procurement. Okay. Um, but I don't think we can say, hey, I like these three that I've always worked with. I want these three to be the only ones that can do type thing. You know what I mean? Like yeah. somewhere it's got to be wide open for anybody to sort of submit their at application. Least submit their qualifications yeah, interest. to then come into a negotiation of yep. What yeah, I think it's it could be yeah whatever you you know your group decides uh, <laughs> makes sense. Like if you, I, I think I've seen that kind of thing before where you put out you know solicit interest in the newspaper or you know various mm -hmm. methods maybe with the you know the, the county forester could put the qualifications mm -hmm. together and like no, notice that this is going out. Please submit. So I think that's and then and then you could take that list of. Applicants. Also, the county forester is willing to, you know, of course, be in communication with you to, to, to further uh, hash out these details if that's helpful. 
fine line of having to meet our policy, but also meet what the intent is there. Right. Is there a specific committee that, like, would the Conservation Commission be a part of the bid review? Or Can you wait and let the board? Sorry. Ask the questions first, and then we'll go to the public. It's probably going to take some, at least seeing it, I would think. Like, this is the document or the process we intend to use, and this meets or doesn't meet our policy. But I think we can do a qualifications based. Selection. Yeah, that's where you get the competitive bidding would be on, say, a request for qualifications. That's an open call. Um, there's some review process to say amongst those who best meets the qualification set. You can even take the two or six. So if you were lucky enough to have that bounty respondents, we had five, then maybe go through the qualifications and invite a couple of them to then submit some kind of quote so that you can then compare the financial details. Yeah. Right, so the county forest, forester, probably you, somebody from the town staff to review the qualifications. And so you have a, you basically want a fair opportunity for people to respond and then a fair review of the, right, the ones that come in. You might score them five out of six points and Trevor might give them three and and you average them type process. Yeah, is there a mechanism for some kind of a, you know, to spin off that, pro start that process, like subcommittee or something, or how does that work, or is it just coming back to more select board meetings, or does that get handled no, over email? You, you, the county forester gives you the document that they would like to release, mm -hmm. and then you review it. Does this make sense? And probably your committee and Trevor come together, then it comes to us when it's ready okay. to get approval to release it. The, the, for like the, the request for proposals, basically? Yeah, qualifications. Okay. Lots of times they call them RFQs, request yeah. for qualifications. Okay. Then you narrow it down and then you can negotiate with them the, you know, the work and rates and all that. Forrester sends the qualifications, we'll slap it into a pre-existing RFP style template that has all of the submission requirements and we just have to set dates for responses and it's usually electronic submission but this might be a category of vendor we want to allow either option physical or electronic and you know, pretty quickly we put together the scaffold and something that could go out but the, it's the qualifications piece what the forester is looking for in particular so the, that, that's the piece that would be the most helpful to get <coughs> from him and the rest of it fits our template pretty easily, I think, or can. Yeah, I can try to get my hands on that as quickly as possible. Yeah. He's just gonna take it out of the state template. <laughs> get rid of the state template and let the town's template take its place. And yeah, yeah, and he might have some, he had, told, he had told the Conservation Commission about some particular concerns he had with the, there's, there's dense uh, understory that is sensitive that he wants to protect particularly uh, so uh, but I'm sure he can easily put together the language that he has around that and the RQ is probably just asking do you have the ability right to do this type stuff you know are you willing to walk in there and do it versus come in with machinery and those type of pieces Select right or, or whatever it is but it, I, I think a fully mechanized method is one that he would the forester was thinking might actually do the, the least damage that reaches out and picks the tree cuts it cuts it to length and pulls it out without driving around a lot depending on the operator right and yes exactly exactly that's the whole that's the whole question yes you want me operating there. <laughs> there would be nothing mass destruction <laughs> Direction. Did you have something you wanted to add to? Um, yeah, just separate from my question. Um, I am here as the board chair of Ridgeline Outdoor Collective, and I've been just so you all are aware, um, working with the Conservation Commission over the past many years, but more recently with this potential project as well as the upcoming reservoir renovation project. So I just wanted to let you all know that. Uh, we're hoping to be really adamant on um, public education around these projects going on and um, 
make sure that you all don't face any undue frustration from residents around these projects and make sure that there's good communication on those things so there's no confusion as to how we got to a process of pulling lumber or moving the reservoir. And um, so any way that we can help you all with communicating that to our user audience, we're kind of tertiary stakeholders as the trail managers. So um, yeah, whatever we can do to help with that. So I think the next steps on that is just to get the, the two of you guys together to create the RFP that then comes for approval to the Okay. Do it. Thank you. Here. Consider awarding a special meeting for the FY24 revised police district funded vote. Going back to your last meeting in April, one of the takeaway tasks was to complete a warning for a special meeting statute envisions that when you have a budget defeated at the polls that you'll keep coming back and trying again and again and again until you get a number. Um, so this would be for that second attempt on the revised budget that you essentially approved as a body last time. This would be so you call it the zero tax rate impact budget as part of the level one assignment. Um, so that is in those packets after the soil reports which We'll administer your soil tests later to the new members to see if you can correctly identify Tunbridge versus the uh, any other soil types. <laughs> very, very well. No pressure. Tunbridge versus Peru versus Lyman. <laughs> Which one's the rockies? Um, so that's in there is 5C1. It's just a one article warning instead of the exact article one for town meeting, except that the dates changed. Voting would still be here. They're still voting by out, um, absentee ballot. It's all done by Australian ballot. That's how the original vote was done and how we determine these types of money questions. The proposed meeting date is 33 days out, not counting today. So it falls within that window between 30, uh, not less than 30, no more than 40. That we usually warn votes. That also provides us plenty of time to make sure that absentee ballots are available at least 20 days prior. The timeline is also in there, the blue, blue, blue chart. It's about 22 days before the election, so we've got a little bit of wiggle in that um, in terms of just to make sure that we can get them printed and, and ready to go. Um, it just goes through. It's the same wording that we saw in March, just with those numbers changed in terms of total expenditure, the estimated non-police district property tax revenue, or <coughs> revenues, um, and then was to be raised inside the police district. So that warning would be for a meeting on Special meetings of the voting on May 16th, polls from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. The public informational meeting on May 9th. That's about seven days on the nose prior to the meeting, so it falls within the window for that as the goal of that. So we just do what we do here where there's a hybrid format. People can come by, they can participate online, and we'll try to do a little more than we've done for some of those, we'll do a little presentation on the budget, some of the process stuff, but finally, uh, it's there for that little intro and then public comment. Um, you do have a meeting in between if you want to use that for any reason to, to do stuff. One of the other questions that we raised in the, in the package is whether or not to mail ballots to everyone. We do have that option in there as well. Um, it's about $950 was it. Some time, staff time to cut, and cut pieces of paper and stuff, envelopes, but you know, they call for all hands. And, figure out how to get that done pretty quickly. The reason we put that on the table is turnout in March was 23% of the registered voters inside the district. Um, and we looked into that further. There were concentrations in terms of where voters started and ended their days. Um, and so to try to broaden participation to give more people the opportunity. Plus, this is a special meeting in May. People aren't, unless you live in Barrytown, you're not used to voting in May. They're the only ones who do it on the regular. <laughs> so there's also that element of people aren't necessarily thinking about that on days where the weather goes to 80 and the sun comes out. Um, so there's that consideration too. So it's really a, a, an attempt to, to try to turn out up a little bit higher too. There's a little bit of a, of a cost associated, but we thought we'd at least include that for consideration. It did bump turnout. I don't have the numbers with me, but I remember at one point we did have a conversation when Emory was in about mailing ballots. And that during COVID, it did seem to at least boost that participation number. I uh, wouldn't expect that we'll go from 23 to 73%, but if we go from 
23 to 30 in a special election in May. That's one thing to worry about. So there's some value. The absentee ballots do make it easier, though, if you have other constraints because you can vote early um, and remotely in that mechanism. So there's, that. there's some other posting requirements that are laid out on the timeline, all the physical ones and stuff that goes to our website. All of those things will happen as soon as you won the meeting, so it's early as tomorrow and no later than Monday. Um, actually, probably as early as tomorrow, some of the physical ones, and then we've got some published in the newspaper tech requirements that have to be within a certain time and date range, so we'll get those ahead of time, too. With a weekly paper, we just need to make sure we're getting stuff in at the end of the day, too, the day to hit that Thursday marker. So that's all the time, but that's the pretty simple warning there. Any questions on the warning? Comments? No. Any I'd like to, to move the uh, placement of the warning as as stated here. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Do we want a mail ballot? Yes. Nine hundred fifty dollars is pretty cheap. Yeah, I would. I would favor that. Um, uh, just to maximize, especially as because as Trevor mentioned, it's it's an unusual time of year. For, so I think that the greater awareness there is in the and the ease of voting, um, uh, both those things, I think it's to our advantage to do. We don't need to vote that, right? It, I think it would help just to create a process marker, if you would. You know, the statute, I mean, it's in there, but just formalize the action. I'll move to approve $950 of mail-in ballots at the village. And I'll second. And do you have something for the discussion on moving uh, uh, not on moving it, but it would be extremely helpful to the voters, I think. It would certainly be for me. When mailing these ballots out, um, if there was some actual real place in within that packet that explains things, that justifies a budget. I voted for the budget when it first came out. Unfortunately, so many others didn't. Um, but if there was a breakdown to justify those numbers, I think maybe um, it would be helpful for a lot of people. So and yeah. the and process doesn't allow you to mail it with the ballot. Well, if there was some place, the if there was some place that we could go to look, but to find those numbers, I wasn't able to. And I was astounded when I read the town report last year or the year before to learn that the library budget was more than the police budget at that time. And, you know, I got a lot of flack from people on Front Porch Forum praising the library. Well, <coughs> it's nothing against the library, but I think the police and the job that they do is a lot more encompassing and expensive than a library that has a lot of static costs. So for maybe some people would understand where that money is going and be more apt to approve it if there was some place that we could go to to explain it the, better. The, the meeting on the 9th, as mentioned in the warning, is statutorily required, and it's a it's a public information and information uh, hearing and informational meeting, and that's exactly where and the explanation all, takes It's also place. out on the website. The proposed budgets out there. The I understand the, the proposed budget is, there. but a breakdown of the budget is what I'm getting at. And that meeting, as great as that would be, um, a lot of people might not be able to make it to mm -hmm. it, and mm -hmm. it doesn't give you that much time to consider it. If you don't, you know, if you're not s scratching down all sorts of numbers, it would be nice if you could go to it. That's the beauty of the mail-in ballots is you actually can give it some. Thoughtful consideration is, I think, the intent behind a lot of it, and convenience. But if there was a place that we could go that had a <coughs> real breakdown of budgets, um, that would be very helpful prior to that meeting, because then at the meeting we could ask questions about mm -hmm. it. But if we're just given the numbers at the meeting, 
it's kind of hard to think up intelligent questions and, and not waste people's time. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that, that the Randolph voters, with the additional information, might make other choices. Um, that, that's my hope. Okay, we have a motion and a second on the floor to move the topic. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Is the, um, on the town's website right now, the FAQs are out there, correct? Yes, what we have and is a cover memo with the budget, so explaining the changes from the town meeting version to this revised version. There's the budget, which has the detailed lines with it. There's a tax rate impact table that goes with it, so you can see by categories of residents. You residential property, but if you're in you know, property without value, you can figure out. Um, there are the FAQs for the revised budget, so they go through level of service, cost, changes in budgets, some of those types of questions. The other two versions from before are still up there, so people can at least track historically where we've been. And we've talked about adding some other materials up there as well. Um, you know, the draft warning will go up there with it, any of those types of things. If we make any adjustments to any of the presentation materials. Um, so next up is review and discuss the town attorney's opinion on the articles of merger. Which I, I did receive it. It was just about showtime when it came in. I had enough chance to look at it once and talk to the attorney very briefly. The item that we added for later for attorney-client communication is about that. Um, that's not an uncommon way to start, that we get what is essentially a privileged product to us, and then we're able to determine from there how to go about pulling it apart to make it public, you know, which pieces. So that fits in a little bit with that. I have not had a lot of time with it. We had one sort of very cursory conversation about a very quick read-through. So I've got that for you. I didn't even have time to send it to you. We do have it. We'll need to review it. There'll probably be some additional questions. So that's what that item is. Um, and at some point, we will take that from there and start to describe sort of the public aspects of those questions. Okay. Um, so next up then is considering creating the police district committee. Um, so while I didn't get it out the week after the last meeting, which was my target, <laughs> I did make it before this meeting. Only by a few days for those of you that are depending on performance. <laughs> um, so there's a draft committee purpose members, what they're going to do, what the questions are. Um, this is a, a select board committee, the group that will report back to the select board. Um, so if anybody has any comments or you think you're missing things or whatnot, we can. Can you, just for the benefit of the public, can you walk us through a little bit of, of what it is? Of what it is in terms of the structure and that kind of thing. Um, so this was um, this is creating a nine-member committee, um, which will have uh, two members that are select board members, one from inside the district, one from outside the district. Uh, it has three members from inside the district boundaries and three from outside, and one member representing the business community that's preferably not a Randolph resident. One of the big complaints we've heard is we get to pay for it, but we don't have any say in it. So it's trying to correct that a little bit. Um, it identifies some basic skills of what we should be looking for in the members, and you know, just not, not to have story time, but. Um, it's, we're looking for some, maybe with some financial background, some policing background, process solution oriented, history of the town, background in various parts of the town, such as the youth, mental health, domestic violence, drug use, abuse and impacts, and rural community needs. Um, committee will be chaired by a select board member. There will be an organizational meeting set to determine schedule, work plan, and process. It'll be staffed by the town manager and as needed by the chief of police. And the things that we're looking at um, are, in, here's the, the, I'll read you the five statements that I put in here. Uh, Randolph has a split model for services in a defined village area and then outside of the village area. 
The needs for each area are different and should be defined to understand the services needed and the level of those services. Item two, the types of services needed do not all require a law enforcement officer. Define which services could be, defined, could be provided through current resources in town other than law enforcement or for which another service could be developed to cover that need. Examples would be constable, community resource person, or services through Claire Martin Center. The third item is for those services that require law enforcement officer, what's the right level of service for the town to be providing? And what should the town be relying on state police for? Fourth, is there an opportunity to partner with others to provide some or all of the services needed, a regional model, or towns with their own departments alternating coverage for overnight? And the uh, fifth item is develop a budget for the service models that can be presented to the select board and the public. We've set a deadline for no as November 9th for this committee to report back but I've also asked for progress reports on a monthly basis. And that's my first staff at a charge for that committee. So. Um, I just had one question about the, the ninth member, the <coughs> potentially a business community representative, preferably not a Randolph resident. Um, there are business community members that are not village restaurants who have the same right, right? Mm -hmm. that they, they don't have a voice. So I'm just wondering if we can have a little bit of flexibility there. Um, not necessarily a non-resident, but a non-village resident, because I've spoken to any number of business people that you know have that same gripe that live in the East Randolph or Randolph Center or whatever. So. Yep, that's a good question. Um, how do we plan on getting this information out to find these nine heroes? Yeah, what will be the well, process for, right here. <laughs> uh, what, what would be the process for choosing, you know, for naming the people? Well, I think we got to go through a similar process to what we do with our other committees where people <coughs> express their interest in <coughs> what they see their qualifications. That's what we did the last time. Mm -hmm. And then we sat down and looked at them all and looked at what a good balance was on that. Um, I, I think it's a combination of how we do the others, where we go out on front page forum looking for them, we put it on the website, we advertise in the paper. I don't know where else we can, any place that we can get the word out and then give a deadline for people to put in their letters of interest. And conceivably make those appointments next month? Does that seem reasonable? Possibly. But they've got less than a month to advertise and get their letters in. It's a hot, hot item. People yeah. ought to be, yeah. you know. And it's also we a haven't been quiet time is of the essence here, right? If we're going to yeah. push this forward. we got to deliver by November. We can't wait too many months <coughs> to appoint yeah. the committee. Some of the ma not magic of November is that it provides a little bit of wiggle. You need a little extra time, and there's a little bit built into it, but really it cues everything up for if we have to enter a budget process, basically. Exactly. We're on the front end of it, or closer to the front end of it, as opposed to trying to come back in mid-January with two weeks to a town meeting, figuring out, you know, avoiding what we, the situation we found ourselves in <laughs> earlier this year. Through I didn't little, get to do that, though. Through a little play. <laughs> it, it really didn't miss anything. <laughs> uh -huh. Certain things you don't need. Yeah. <laughs> you would consider yourself fair. <laughs> um, okay. Do you think the items that are listed are the ones that it'll take to make a decision? <clears throat> you know, I think I, I think cl the clearly there's a, you know, there's a timeline to the different items, like. Obviously, examining a regional model is is worthy of the 
that we're calling this the working group, the task force, the advisory group's discussion, but that's something that's further out, you know, reality-wise than uh, some of the other options. And I think you got to set your your service expectations and levels before you can begin to think about what your model looks like. Yeah. You know, what are those services you need? And then once you define what those are, then look at how you deliver them. Right, so yeah. somebody just needs something basic. Can you go tell this guy to quit parking here? Maybe there's a different level of, yeah. of what you need for that. Maybe that's the community peace officers. Right. You know, the, there's always room in areas for training those people, but that also requires funds and a budget for traffic enforcement or parking enforcement or you know, that kind of stuff. So just can't forget that training those people also includes funds to do that. So and I think there's a lot of room for looking at this collaborative approach too that you've suggested here in terms of whether it's Clara Martin Center or um, you look at what other communities around the state are doing, most notably Burlington, which Lord knows policing has been an issue there the last couple of years. And um, they're really developing some in innovative programs now working with the Howard Center, which is their mental health provider in Chittenden County. Um, so when officers are going out to confront situations where there's a possible mental health component or you know, psychiatric component, there's someone who is partnering with them on those calls. And I think that's something that we would really benefit from. Someone with, with crisis intervention and, and you know, social work intervention. This, um, this group could actually reach out to them and say, how's this working? Yeah. Would you do it again? Yeah. The infamous question. Yeah. Anybody want to make a motion to create the committee? I'll make a motion that we create the committee as described in, uh, in the memo from uh, Chair Broussard. <laughs> as spelled out just now. Changing it to village, adding the village in the one spot. Hmm? Adding to change it to so it's yeah, just not be a village resident. Right. So. I'll second that. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Hi. Next up is approving a dispatch services contract with Ferry City. This is one you had in your packets, but wasn't in the public one because it's still a contract. If you have questions or stuff you want to discuss, we do have contracts listed for executive sessions. It's one of the reasons that it's there. It seems pretty standard. I think we're all pretty satisfied with it. It combines the new police services dispatch contract with an earlier one for fire dispatch. And we went over that a little bit. I think at the last meeting we were in December, we very suddenly found ourselves without fire dispatch. It was a proposed 18 month drawdown, became a two week one. Uh, as people moved and found it in other places. So, every city was kind enough to take us on. So, it creates one document rather than the two separate ones. It's really sort of an interim document that goes through the next 18 or so months. Um, that provides us with that primary dispatch service. Some of the questions we had about it were more about um, operation and contract provisions. So one of the things they do overnight when we may not be staffed is stack calls is what it is, but really it's about sort of listing everything that comes in, figuring it out where it fits in that kind of emergency framework. Does it require a BSD response to the phone or that model? Should somebody else be called out? By and large, they go and they sit there, and Scott and his crew in the next morning, you know, whoever's first one on, like on, sees hopefully not too many of them, but um, sees that list of calls and starts to actually work through those. So there was some conversation about uh, some communication provisions if something comes in that doesn't, isn't all hands on deck, but doesn't necessarily wait till the morning, can there be some kind of notice to either an on call officer to somebody in that chain? And so I think we can achieve that through working together as opposed to trying to make it into an agreement at this point. But, yeah. This will keep us independent of some of the other networks too, so there's a little bit more command control of our own infrastructure, our own communication when you think about where we started to where we are too. So there's some equipment that 
we own that we didn't before that's been replaced that, that needs to be separate from the contract that ties into the dispatch. Any questions? contract hasn't already been written I would hope that there's some sort of consideration since we don't even know how our policing is going to be structured yet that there are conditions fit at to address any changes um, so that we don't wind up finding ourselves in a position like we did with the Orange County Sheriff who just said that's that um, at, and I don't know where those funds came from. I assume that when we contract with someone that we pay for it up front or at least on a quarterly basis or something like that. As service is delivered. Okay. So it's after they but, deliver the service. So they don't deliver the service, they don't get paid. Well, that's good to know because... <laughs> yes. <laughs> we don't prepay. Um, but yeah, it, to make sure that there's some sort of consider... Since everything is in flux, I don't know how you can have a, a, a solid contract without, you know, having a lot of uh, considerations or caveats. I think one of the things that provides us a level of safety that we didn't have before is we were outside of the county model with the elected side judges, the elected sheriffs, with the sort of the lack of qualifications in some cases needed to hold those positions. So we fall farther outside of a political framework that involves people who don't so they vote here. Yeah, it's Barry City, but they're one of the public safety answering points for the state. They're well established. It would be highly, highly, I don't even want to say this out loud because they'll probably jinx it for the luck we've had. It is incredibly <laughs> unlikely that that service between now and June 30, 2024 is going to go away or be unavailable to us. Um, so we, I think we picked one of the safer options. We had sort of Barry City. We reached out to Hartford 2, which is a similar setup, and they just weren't able to focus on. I think we landed as safely as we could, and we have a shorter term agreement, and we can see how it works. And if you want to stay with them, make adjustments to that. And they've served us before, so we have some familiarity. We know about reliability. So it's a, um, you know, a known dance partner to a certain extent, so, which helps. all helps. Mm -hmm. Consider the local emergency management plans adopted. I put these documents together for you quickly um, today. We don't have any other revised ones. It doesn't look like there are too many changes. I think that's pages. I do not need you to sign off on a softball league. T-shirts. How about that? This. Um, really what these are, these are, are annually required documents. They tie into our main emergency management response framework. It's really sort of a list of Assets, contacts, vulnerable populations. By doing these on time, we maintain maximum grant uh, eligibility. We maintain the most favorable matches through some of the state and federal funds. Which is on the right side of that, provides that contact info um, <coughs> to those folks um, at the various state and regional levels. We coordinate with them through the Regional Planning Commission on this one. Um, I think there are some places where I go back and maybe fill in some of the additional contact info in the final sheet, but those names, numbers, and email addresses appear in three or four other places um, as well. Um, so we might make a few of those adjustments, but there aren't really any changes to this other than names of those involved. So we have two new emergency management coordinators. Um, so those folks are added there with their email addresses and phone numbers. The, the tenant who's the barracks commander in Royalton has changed, so we've updated that name, for example. Some of the other names have changed in there as well. In terms of, of what this needs in an actual emergency response, it kind of identifies who has at least some initial response authority, and then if we had an emergency that extended out, you 
starting to pull in different assets. We added our new police chief to these lists as well. Um, kind of depends on the type of disaster. We have a natural disaster, the road infrastructure, the highway super, you know, that EOC can get more and more crowded based on the type of event we have. So it's just a starting point. Who do we pull in? How do we get it going? That's what those are. So those are adjusted. We can send it out to see if there are any any other adjustments that folks who are more intimately involved in it want to make. Identified shelter types of resources contacts there. So those types of things. But it's an annual requirement. So we haven't had any change in that. There's no new big public shelters or no. assets. That's I think it's just the few names. I could add a new sewer jetter as a piece of equipment, but I couldn't find the uh, NIMS based code for it. So we have it, we can deploy it. It just may not appear in the table. Sure, there's a code somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> other, other equipment. Yeah. So if we ever need pressurized water, we can do it. Um, there's only one school contact on here. Would that be something we'd update later? We could. That's, <laughs> and that was carried over from prior versions, so it's entirely. We could all have that. Yeah, there are. I just stole something. Yeah. Yeah, um, Sorry. So we, we can always add to it, and it's just simply. I think some of these are the contact info, and we don't need to take any action throughout the year, but it's going to change. Cool. This gets us in there so that if we. You know, May 1st, there's a weather event that. Well, that's not. Let's hope not. Again. <laughs> okay. And then we'll have to. Make a to that. So, I just want to have it signed by somebody who is in the ICS certified at a 100 or 402 level. I think I'm still. I think I'm still. Okay, I think I'm still within my window. My last time. <laughs> I see it's an like emergency. emergency. That's all I know. It's, it's yeah. an emergency training. Yeah, incident <laughs> command system training. So Ooh, yeah. all kinds of that that before, actually. <laughs> I mean, do we, we could set one up if you're interested. It's an hour and a half that you'll you can do it never online, get too. back, but <laughs> the ICS certified. It's online, too. You can just do that. That's cool. I do know. Yeah, I do it. Yeah. So you want to make a motion to adopt it? So moved. Second. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, approving the application for the Class 2 paving grant. Yeah, these are their annually available grants. We haven't had one, I say 2019 was the last time we did one take for a portion of Wendover Road. We'd like to apply again. It used to be. I was always told that about every three years if you apply, you can count on some kind of award, so we're on the outer edge of that range. Hopefully that's still, <coughs> East Bethel Road was the candidate we talked to her about the most. That was in the paving list last year. We removed it at that time. The idea would essentially be a simple shim and overlay, so this is just where we kind of go, try to level it out, and put either an inch and a half or two inches on top. That's treatment we've been applying pretty broadly. One of the ideas is to go through the sort of a level of treatment and then from there start to build out a more robust plan that might start some reclamation projects, get on a regular maintenance cycle, but can we raise the baseline um, for as broad a category of paper as possible? If we're able to get that, that's a max award of $200,000. We've got to put $40,000 in. That's a, what's the work out today? It's a couple mile stretch basically from right around DTC to where the road forks uh, becomes. the section we're talking about there. Um, and that would go with the rest of our paving plan, which might involve South Randall or a few other places down this way. Um, if we get the grant, obviously, we're able to do more within sort of a footprint. If we don't, we may have to reconfigure. Um, we've been trying to spend, we were working around like 350 um, a year last year. We went a little bigger, and then it was closer to 475. Once you added all of those roads in, we do have the capability to do that again and set ourselves up for the out years, but um, we're trying to keep sort of almost like a five-year outlook or a four more year outlook after we would start here. Um, and so we'll go around do another assessment and build a paving RFP that includes kind of the ones that we, we most want to hit. 
we're trying to triage based on condition and also how heavily is it used? Is it adjacent to something else we're going to do? Uh, or some other factors in addition to condition. But this would, I've got to get this in tomorrow. It's a pretty simple application. We say what we want to do and what we think it would cost. And we've stolen some paving calculators from other places, so we'll do the best we can. Give them more selective on the contract. <laughs> <laughs> just saying. Yeah. Just saying. <laughs> that contract document's going to be really, uh, really, really specific. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want to make a motion to approve the application being submitted? Submitted. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Approving the annual highway certificate. Well, you're in an annual mood. These are two pieces we've got to do each year. The TA60, which is our annual financial plan. This is one of the requirements to get the state highway aid. Um, it's I think the one real source of direct payment we get from the state. We do get some pilot current use money as well, but that depends on the properties you have that are enrolled or, or that are otherwise eligible. I'm trying to look up the amount. Like, we're supposed to spend, I forget exactly what it was per mile, but it's a really low amount, like $2,000 per mile. And as you can see, after we weigh everything out, we spend $19,700 per mile. So we're certainly eligible for our award. I think the concern with the minimum amount is that they didn't want towns to take state highway aid and use it for rural taxes. Uh, they wanted to go into a highway program of some kind. We certainly meet that mark. So that's the financial plan. And that what goes with it is that we certify that we're, we've adopted town road and bridge standards and we're still in compliance with those. So we've updated those in the last few years. Um, we'll certify that at some point. We'll have to go back through and revise all of those and then marry up the different versions we have of local and state ones. They're a more cohesive set, but they, they tend to agree more often than not. There's no direct money that comes with this, but it does play in if we wanted to go get it. I think a town highway structures grant for bridges or big culverts. So they're going to want to know that we've got this part done. Any questions on that? Mm -hmm. Not a motion to approve. A motion to adopt the annual forms presented. <coughs> Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Consider awarding the bid for cemetery mowing. For, we went out and looked for a two-year contract. We started this last year when we found ourselves pretty suddenly with one employee in the <laughs> Buildings and Grounds Department. Um, and so this is to mow and do some of the general maintenance spring and fall cleanup for the East Randolph and Randolph Center cemeteries. It worked really well. Put it out to bid again this year. We put it in the budget anticipating we do that, knowing that we'd have a hard time finding people to fill those slots still based on experience, pay rate, some of those things. Um, we had one bidder, it's, uh, uh, Seth Fernandes, he was the successful bidder from last year, performed to our specifications in a timely manner. Um, we don't have any concerns about awarding again this year. The total would be about $38,000 a year. So in the budget, we'll have to be mindful that it's, it's a small gap between what we budgeted and this, it's about $2,000. We can make that up in some other, other places. Any questions on this? If not, motions to agree. Well, that's so moved. Second. All those in favor? <coughs> Aye. 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 Discuss Fourth of July fireworks. So this is a now becoming an annual tradition, it feels like all its own. But um, it was last February we were approached pretty suddenly about whether or not we had any interest, we being the town in this case, in trying to coordinate, fund, or otherwise take on the 4th of July fireworks display. At the time, the decision was to try to work with some other organizations, see if there's a way to get, you know, whether it be Rotary or someone else involved in fundraising, coordination, volunteer provision. It was a cost and volunteer tier based decision. The cost jumped from six to $10,000 for a minimum display. This year, it looks like it's going to be $12,000 something that the village fire department isn't able, hasn't been able to carry anymore, which they did for a while. Last year, I think, you know, Perry 
Armstrong working with the Village Fire Department. That was a display at Forest Hill eventually. Um, so it's just on the earlier, early-ish end, this is a general discussion of is there a role for us to play in a 4th of July fireworks display in 2023. Similar to last year's kind of thing, we just don't have the resources. I don't know who I would ask to but say no. go ahead and coordinate, and we don't no. have any fireworks money, so it's we'd be trying to get real creative. Well, so Mr. Perry. Perry is not doing it this year, nor is the fire department. So well, there's nobody that's stepped up um, at this point. I did speak yesterday briefly. Um, the contract has been signed for the fireworks. Um, Perry would like to be the head of the fireworks committee for the town. <laughs> um, he would like to have it on July 3rd at Mars Hill. And he said that the $12,000 will come from people and charities and businesses, and he would like to volunteer to head it up. And then it will get done. Well, there you go. Mm -hmm. Good for Perry. I think Perry's missing being on the select board. <laughs> <laughs> That's he was wonderful singing offer. a different tune a month ago. Yeah. This, I, I just put this out there. I've noticed. Other towns uh, in the region, often in their special allocations on town meeting day that are approved on a case-by-case -case basis, will sometimes um, from the 4th of July fireworks through that method and assign the responsibility for management to uh, the Chamber of Commerce or the Rotary or the Boys and Girls Club or whatever, you know, entity. Might. So I just put that out there. So you used to get paid by the fee to get in. Right? So the fire department, you had to pay to get into the field to watch the fireworks, and then they sold food and whatever, and that paid. Right. Uh, and then they quit doing it down there when the school bought the land. <coughs> they moved to Fars Hill. It was kind of a uh, hybrid one year, and then it moved to Fars Hill. So I think some of it is that it's getting out of that realm of people paying to watch it and participate and, and I think last year they didn't weren't able to do the food the way they wanted to which is why the fire department's stepping out mm -hmm. well it's good if Perry wants to do it right. Right. so great. my question I guess would be if it's more than 500 people do the thing with the noise and the things that uh -huh. we talked about do you know? yeah he files a form got it yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He knows. <laughs> he has no excuses. <laughs> 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 huh. Yeah. 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 Nothing really to add from what's written other than the crew was up on Tatro Hill for that washout section again today. Um, <laughs> And tomorrow we're renting an excavator, which will help us. Uh, similar to what we did on North Randolph Road last summer, where it just provided us with better capability to, to reach dig place um, stonework. It looks like it was sort of an undermining washout type of situation. Um, appeared pretty suddenly, and they got to it pretty quickly. Uh, <coughs> so we're, we're working from that. And then, um, we're still waiting for the repair list for FY23 paving. We went out and looked at everything, we assessed all the different areas and, and levels of treatment. Um, the idea would be to get that done as early as possible in the spring. That then facilitates painting your crosswalk stuff, orders, all of that. Trying not to paint them and pave them and then paint them again um, is the goal. Um, and that also pays you know, the street sweeping along the main street, some of those corridors that would be part of that. Paving project that we made, depending on the timing, end up doing those. We started with some of the cider and ancillary streets first. And then, yeah. and then in May, we may come back with a grant agreement for that NEP issue that's listed there, but we've got to put together an agreement with them first before we sign a grant agreement with the state. And make sure we understand what we're buying. <laughs> It's a fair amount of responsibility for a process through which we don't control 
a lot of the letters, the information on. I think we could fly through the eye of that, you know. If not, we'll crash through it, make it through anyway. <laughs> we'll do what we do, we'll just crash through it. We'll be, we'll be okay. Mm. This is a two-part, yep. So the finding first, that it's prudent and necessary. I, okay, repeat after me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'd like to, I move that it is um, prudent and necessary to go into executive session for the purposes of discussing, discussing um, uh, contracts and um, legal Council uh, issues the premature, premature disclosure of which could put the town at risk. Seconded. <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Now you need the motion to. Oh, sorry. Motion carries. Go ahead. Motion to enter now, which cites the specific provisions of statute under which you're entering. So it's 1 VSA 313A1A for contracts, 1 VSA 313A1F for attorney client communications. Uh, so moved. <laughs> what he said. All those in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Thanks, everyone.